So I'll just start by acknowledging the country that I am living and working on, which is the Ngunnawal country in Canberra. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and recognise their continuing connection to country. Um, I'm Jennifer Doggett. I will be hosting it today together with Harry Hillsman. Or he'll be able to introduce himself in a minute. Um, I have a couple of decades of experience in the health system sector in a number of different roles. So I've worked in the health department. I've worked as a political advisor on health issues. I do work as a health journalist and also some government relations and lobbying work. So I have some experience from a number of um, different, different points in the health sector, but I'm not a consumer advocate and I have never worked as a consumer advocate. So my job today is to give you some tools and some information which will helpfully, helpfully help you, hopefully help you in your work but I'm not here to tell you how to be an advocate and how to do your job because that is not my experience. And Harry, if you're there, I'll just hand over to you to introduce yourself. Yes, I can see you're there. Fantastic, I am. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, acknowledge the traditional owners uh, from where I'm joining you all from, which seems to be uh, a populous one today, Gadigal land here in Sydney. Um, so I've sort of, I guess for me, it's sort of useful to sort of frame two, two lists of credentials. Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm a patient um, myself managing uh, complex chronic illness and disability. Um, I've most recently undergone uh, two liver transplants in the last uh, two years uh, and spent 40 plus weeks uh, admitted to hospital. Uh, so it's been a bit of a, a wild couple of years for me, but I'm very, very happy to be joining everyone today and contributing and being part of the dialogue. Um, the other side of what I do is um, working um, and I guess leveraging my lived experience in this space. Uh, I'm a disability, chronic illness and mental health advocate. Uh, I'm one of the current cohorts of young leaders with the Youth Health Forum, um, but I've been involved with the YHF um, really since its inception and have a long-standing relationship with Consumers Health Forum as well. Um, I've previously been a National Youth Mental Health, and Health Ambassador with Headspace as part of the Visible Stigma Reduction Campaign. Um, and as part of my work, I've really got a number of roles uh, across the health sector, uh, working with peak bodies and agencies at all levels of government, uh, and also with private organisation and not-for-profits, um, really around that lived experience engagement um, and health strategy facilitation. I also do work as a speaker. Uh, and run my own business, which focuses on working with those organisations to create and implement more effective strategies and frameworks for engaging and partnering with patients, consumers and advocates like us, so that ultimately decisions about us that affect us don't get made without us. And, um, yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Thanks, Harry. Um, now, I'll just um, bring up some slides so you don't need to stare at um, my talking head while I go through the um what we're talking about today can everyone see that that good got some heads up so I'll just give you an overview of what we're going to talk about today and that so the aim of the webinar is to give um give you a broad understanding of the health system that's going to help you in your advocacy work so we're going to cover off a brief history of the health system the role of different levels of government some of the main funding programs and the role of other organisations such as statutory authorities and NGOs. So we're going to talk at you for a little bit. I'm going to have two breakout sessions and also a break in the middle so everyone can go make a cup of tea. Um, and please don't hesitate to ask questions as we go. Feel free to interrupt, put questions in the chat, etc. And um, we'll try to do our best to answer them or interrupt me if something doesn't make sense or you want to add comments or have some thoughts or have any other questions. Um, as I mentioned before, some of you may have joined, we do understand that some of the issues we're talking about can, can be quite personal. It may bring up issues for you. And we just want to make sure that everyone knows that CHF is there to support you. I've put um, some details in the chat for Louise, who's happy to speak to anyone who may need some support during or after the webinar and also some other numbers that you might, and organizations you can contact if you feel like you need some support. 
And to let you know, this, the um, webinar is being recorded. It's fine to have your cameras on or off. The breakout sessions won't be recorded. So if um, you want to have your camera on then, you may feel more comfortable. Again, fine if you don't want to. And also just, an, just um, a note that in the breakout sessions, we will be asking people to talk about a health issue that they are interested in, potentially one that you may have yourself, but it doesn't have to be one. And so we just want to make sure that everyone respects people's privacy and um, that they acknowledge that this is a safe space in which people may want to talk about some personal health issues, but that's not to be talked about outside the group in any sort of personal sense. Harry, did you have anything to add to that? Um, I don't think so. I just, I guess, yeah, this is just, you know, sort of we respect everyone's boundaries and what they're comfortable with sharing. Um, I'd encourage you sort of following those breakout, those breakout rooms there, there may be, depending on time, I think an opportunity for a little bit of reporting back from each of the groups to sort of frame some more practical lessons. Um, but I'd encourage people in that sense, not to, um, to reference sort of any, any personal, um, I suppose, perspectives or uh, uh, issues or challenges that other people have raised in those breakout sessions in confidence in the spirit of discussing those issues without their permission um, or, or at all if, if you're not certain. Um, absolutely people are, are free to talk as much or as little uh, personally about what's going on and what they're interested in but um, yeah please just do respect that whilst other people are sharing their stories and potentially their own lived and living experience um, that, that doesn't mean that we can talk about one another um, without each other's permission or understanding on that front. I think that's the only thing I've got to add. But, um, Thanks, Harry. Um, so just a little bit of scene setting before we go into the detail. I just think up front, it's really important to acknowledge that the Australian health system is extremely complex. Um, nobody, I don't think, or very few people actually totally understand all of it. I've been working in the health sector for over 20 years and I'm still learning things, you know, almost every project I do, almost every issue that I take on, there's still things about it I don't understand. Um, so knowing about the health system can help um, in advocacy and I think it's an important tool that advocates can have greater knowledge of the health system but you absolutely don't need to know everything about the health system to be an effective advocate and I think part of the reason um, that the health system is so compl complicated is that there's no grand design no one sat down and developed the health system in a one-off um, process it is an iterative process of development where things get tacked on, bits get added, changes are made on top of other changes. There's no sort of rationality behind the big picture. So, you know, it's evolved in a very ad hoc manner. So if something doesn't make sense in the health system, it's because it doesn't make sense. It's generally not you that doesn't understand it. It's generally because you're correct and it, do it doesn't make sense. And I think that's one reason why consumers and consumer advocates are so important because often it's the consumers that bring together all the dis disparate areas of the health system which aren't integrated with each other and it's consumers that can identify those parts of the health system and, and the experiences which um, don't work, the parts that aren't coordinated, the things that don't make sense together. Um, I think individual providers and stakeholders often don't understand how the health system works or how parts of the health system outside of their immediate experience work. It's often consumers that can fill in that detail for them. They can take a much broader view. And I think that's one reason why consumer advocacy is so important. And I think by linking consumer experience with some knowledge of the health system, consumer advocacy can be a very powerful force for change. So Harry, is there anything you would like to add from your experience? Yeah, I think to pick up on the point about, about sort of how disparate and, and I guess lacking in a grand plan um, and a grand design things are, um, I think that's one of the really, really powerful um, things that advocacy like ours can bring to the table um, is that one of the key issues we have with, with our health system um, is that really its foundations have been built in a different time with different needs and a different purpose. Uh, and unfortunately, that's we've not done a, a great job in the system of actually keeping pace on change and, and evolving and reforming the way that we do things. Um, to keep up with with current needs. So what we have now is is a very reactionary um, system 
and often very reactionary stakeholders um, because ultimately uh, we are really just limited in actually responding to things because there is no intentionality. So I'd really encourage that one of the, the particular strengths of familiarising yourself, again, as Jennifer said, there's no need to be an expert on everything. It's a system so expansive and cumbersome that it, you know, it really is difficult for any one person to get their head around it all. But at least in your area or, or the things that you're interested in or practically you know, when it comes to different parts of the system that, that you're looking to influence, um, learning more about them and developing more of an understanding of how those systems work and the different systems and stakeholders that, that, that they may then interact with is a really, really important way to develop intentionality and uh, I guess a sense of direction and purpose in your own advocacy. Um, so that systems knowledge is really important for learning how to place uh, sort of different players in the system. But more importantly, um, I think it's, it's, it's really about us being able to identify what, when, uh, uh, where and, and how we direct our effort as advocates to realise, you know, really genuinely impactful and meaningful change in the system on, on whatever it is that, that we're particularly trying to, um, to change or, or push some action around. Um, it, it's often the case, uh, frustratingly in my experience, and, and I'm sure a number of you have experienced it, and a lot of you will at some point, um, that often us uh, as advocates being in the room can usually be the only point of common linkage between a number of different sort of silos in the health system or different stakeholders. And while that is uh, at this point, a lot of pressure that gets put on us to bring sort of cohesiveness and a single focus, um, it is a really, really powerful opportunity for us in being involved in a number of different things to actually try and start bringing a consistent thread of thinking so that we can influence decision-making and, ho and hopefully on the system side, um, start contributing to setting up better frameworks that don't rely so much on individuals and actually establish sort of a common baseline of, of engagement um, so that it doesn't fall to, to us being in every single room at every single table um, for, a, for a point to be made consistently across the sector. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And just an example of how marginalised consumers can be in some of these debates, even today, was a debate yesterday at the National Press Club about Medicare reform, where there were two doctors and one health economist, um, all talking about what was important to consumers, but no consumer there at all. And I know CHF made um, that you know point, or people from CHF made that point in um, some tweets about it yesterday. So absolutely, absolutely important to have consumers at the table and also empowered and supported to be able to advocate for um, you know us who are ultimately the users and the funders of healthcare. So I'll just go on to give a, just a brief overview of what we mean when we talk about the health system. And I'll put, you know, system in air quotes, because as we said, it's, it's often, it isn't really a system. And often also not so much about health in a broad sense, more about healthcare. And I think as I chatted to one of the participants earlier, working in early childhood, you know, absolutely vital, you know, determinant of health but not considered part of the health system. So what we're talking about when we usually talk about the health system, these are some of the players. So we're talking about governments at the local, state and federal level. When we talk about governments, we often mean um, both the political arm, so ministers, politicians, and also the bureaucratic arm, which is departments of health. So who carry out the decisions of, of politicians and governments. We're talking about healthcare professionals, both individuals, so, you know, the doctor, the psychologist, also their professional organisations and peak bodies. We're talking about health services where those health professionals work, which can be large, like, you know, hospitals or um, primary healthcare networks, or they can be individual practices or, or clinics. There's also industry sectors and their peak body. So for example, the pharmaceutical sector, the medical devices sector that all play a role in their particular area. There's also financing organizations. So private health insurers who fund some aspects of healthcare and they have peak bodies that will advocate on their behalf to government. 
education and training providers are also important and that can include universities, um, dedicated schools, private providers and professional associations. We have regulatory agencies who have typically have a role in setting and ma maintaining standards. So for example, we might have say the TGA that looks at um, approvals processes for therapeutic goods. And there are also other organisations, so advisory bodies, think tanks, research bodies. So they are some of what we're talking about when we're talking about the health system. And they all have different roles in different ways of um, interacting. Uh, again, Harry, is there something you'd like to add there about how that relates to an experience as an advocate? Yeah, I think to say, um, look, as a, as a good general rule, uh, the more stakeholders, the more complicated things get and the longer stuff takes to get done, uh, which is a pretty frustrating thing. Um, two examples that sort of come to mind for me uh, that, that I guess highlight that you can have a different number of stakeholders, but it's, it's interesting to note the common ways that regardless of the number of sort of stakeholders involved, there are consistent things that you will usually engage with. Um, so one of the sort of the, the bigger and more complex things that, that I've been involved in was uh, something called the National Children's Digital Health Collaborative. Um, the goal of which was to uh, you, I don't, if, if, you, if you're not familiar, there's every state and territory's got their own uh, baby book for recording um, inf infant and childhood developmental um, information. And that's also what uh, doctors use to sort of mark sort of child health checks and, and, and track their health as, as they're growing up to watch out for any issues. Um, now, because this is something that all the states and territories have done themselves, it means that every state and territory had a different baby book. Um, the committee before us um, got to arguing about what color the standardized book should be uh, <laughs> before they took eight months and then got disbanded because they could not agree to, na to, to a, a national standard on what color the new book would be, let alone what was gonna go into it. Mm -hmm. um, now, one of the, the, the really big challenges for something like that um, is that it was, uh, commissioned by the federal government, but it really fundamentally involved um, a cross-jurisdictional approach. You had every state and territory with their different laws and policies, legislation and regulation around recording uh, health data and the format that those would take. Um, you also had an issue in actually standardising and deciding, well, what information do we actually want to record? Because every state and territory records slightly different metrics and, and bits of information about uh, childhood development. So there was not only a, a legislative piece that required constant approval and checking throughout the process, there was also uh, consultation with uh, clinicians uh, and government regulators uh, and other peak bodies to, de to, to define what information we we're actually going to be collecting in this new national, this new national set. Um, and then there was a whole technology development phase as well that required us working with a number of different uh, software developers uh, and, and other technology stakeholders to get that up and running, uh, all then with a separate funding agreement with the federal government and one of their health agencies. So that as, a, as an undertaking took us about five years, um, which was a, a particularly long and complicated process. Um, and, Fortunately, in our case, it did actually end up uh, re result in us making some pretty significant improvements in that space and, and ticking off some milestones that, that previously no other groups had actually been able to, uh, to succeed in. Um, another example that sort of goes to the other end of the spectrum, but also, you know, still captures, um, you, you'll usually get consistent touch points in terms of funding and having to comply with different regulation and legislation, depending on what space you're working in. Uh, but I've previously been involved working with MPS Medicine Wise. Uh, there was a campaign, a national campaign called Choosing Wisely, which was focused around supporting uh, healthy and meaningful conversations between patients and communities and their doctors. Uh, and part of that was also about providing the public with a set of sort of standard questions that can be used as a, as a, good, as a good conversation starter so that people feel more comfortable engaging with their doctors, asking questions, but also raising concerns, you know, about, about things that are going on, like whether or not, you know, you've asked me to get 
some tests or, or, or blood work done. Is that really necessary? You know, it, we I did bloods last week. Do we need to be doing it again? Because uh, most of the time people just sort of say yes to that kind of stuff, but it, you might not need it if you've just had it a week ago already. Um, now, that was a, a far smaller working group. Um, there was still a relationship that we had with funders and still a relationship that we had with different state jurisdictions. Um, but the core group itself was MPS Medicine Wise, some clinicians and myself developing this campaign, and that only took us about six months to do. So part of, and to sort of circle back to that understanding the system and all the different points, part of the strength of having that systems knowledge is, is understanding and being able to more effectively when it comes to sort of projects that you're working on or specific issues that you're trying to tackle um, is figuring out sort of what I call your, you know, I guess your dependencies, um, you know, what sort of, I guess, lines do you have to colour inside of to get something across the line? And if you start having problems or there's an issue identified, where's the best place to actually direct your energy to, to try and find a resolution for that? Fantastic. Thanks. Um, thanks, Harry. And I think that gives a really good example of a common theme that does come up in looking at um, some of the health system issues, which is that tension between having broad collaboration across a number of different areas, but with local responsiveness. So because of the nature of our health system, it is quite devolved in some areas. And there is a tension there often between developing, say, national or regional policies, but also being responsive to the needs of different communities. So I'll just go on to just give a very brief historical perspective, because as, as Harry um, pointed out, a lot of where we have ended up today with our health system has um, his roots in the history of how the health system has evolved. And that is from, say, the earliest um, times of, of colonial Australia, where there was really no health system at all. What it was was basically individual providers, often not very well regulated as you know medical and other healthcare providers weren't in those days just providing care to their communities and charging whatever they wanted to without sort of standards oversight a common agreement around education at that time what grew up were um, what's called mutual or friendly societies which at the start were just very informal um, groups of people who would get together to pool money recognizing that often healthcare expenses were unexpected they would um, incur them you know people would incur them differently so they could be quite a, a, a high expense just because of the unknown risk of healthcare. so you get these sort of ad hoc groups that would arise arise where people would pull money together and then when one of the members needed health care that money would be used um, to pay that to pay those health care expenses and they are sort of the um, precursors of what private health insurance is today and also there was a role for churches and religious institutions who often provided hospitals or health care particularly to people without the means to pay for it so I think the important one important lesson there is that private health insurance and some of these private provisions actually pre-existed before some of the public health systems we have today and that is one reason why why they persist so with federation in 1901 one and the constitution what we saw then was some formal agreement between the colonies the states and the territories and um, the new commonwealth government about who did what and because our federal government came in on top of state governments that involves state governments giving up some of their powers and responsibilities for health care and in that process, it was agreed that the Commonwealth would take responsibility for um, doctors, primary health care in the community, and the states would retain responsibility for um, hospitals. And that is one reason why today you have that difference in, in roles, which can cause so many problems at the interface. Um, another key historical event that catalyzed the development of health system was the post World War I environment and the influenza, worldwide influenza epidemic, which killed more people, as you probably know, than World War I. So I had a lot of people coming back from the war with illnesses and disabilities related to that, um, mental health issues, and also an influenza epidemic. Um, and what that catalyzed was the need for some sort of national 
approach and national coordination of health services and also money to be put into to providing care and support for those people. And it was then that the Department of Health was established in Canberra. It was then that there was a Minister for Health that had responsibility for health within federal government was appointed. Before that, I think there was no actual minister. There was no health portfolio. It was just came under industry or another area of government. Um, and that was the start of the sort of bureaucracy at the federal level that we see today. And again, World War II, you know, 20 odd years later, 25 years later, we saw another wave of people coming back from war with disabilities, with particular health needs. And not long after the Second World War, we saw the creation of another big program, the PBS, which would um, enable people to have subsidised access to medicines. And one catalyst for that was the um, invention of, of penicillin, which then enabled so many conditions to be treated by medicines, which weren't pre previously able to be, to be treated and created a need for access access to those medications. Um, and then we can skip ahead again to the sort of Medicare era, the advent of Medicare, um, from sort of about World War II to about to say the 1960s, it became apparent that the system of private medicine meant that a lot of people were missing out, out of missing out um, of accessing care. Doctors' fees were getting more expensive. Medicine was becoming a higher skilled, higher prestige um, career. There was more doctors could treat, but with that came additional costs and there were large segments of the population who couldn't afford their health care. That created a need um, recognised by first the Whitlam um, in the 70s and then the Hawke in the 80s, Labor governments, who um, developed the system of Medicare, of a, of a universal public insurance, tax funded insurance scheme that would provide rebates for medical services. That was introduced first by Whitlam, then abolished by um, the coalition government that came in after that, and then brought back in 1984 by the Hawke government. Since then, um, we're really in a post-Medicare era we haven't had any major reforms since then. And I think if you look at those sort of dot points, you can see that there's a general pattern of some major kind of reform happening in the health system every sort of generation or so, every 20 to 30 years. So given that Medicare was um, last instigated, the form of Medicare we have today was implemented in, the 19, in 1984, you can see that now we're pretty, over, we're pretty much overdue for another major um, a major wave of reform and some of the debates that are happening around at the moment around reform of Medicare, primary health care, et cetera, I think are part of that process. So that is something as, as I think youth advocates um, is important for you to be aware of that that is a space that you can step into and you can play a role in influencing what that next wave of reform is. Harry, again, is there anything you'd like to contribute in, in relation to you know the historical roots of problems that you have identified in the health system today, yeah, I think one of the one of the particularly sort of frustrating challenges um, that we have is is how disconnected sort of federal and state and territory uh, approaches to health are. Uh, often everyone's kind of gone off and, and done their own thing, and that's practically left us in a, in a pretty tricky spot um, as people accessing care because there there is a lot of stuff that just doesn't make much sense or is actually pretty counterintuitive. Um, one of the things that, that particularly uh, frustrates me, having had a lot of hospital admissions over the last couple of years particularly, um, one of the things that's quite difficult is that in public hospitals there's really a, a hesitancy or I suppose a an effort to try and once you're discharged, push your care out into the community to a gen, you know, to a GP or to primary care. And one of the reasons that that this happens um, is really because the federal and state systems has have become so separate uh, that they're they're really working by two different rule books. Um, one of the, the sort of practical examples of how this actually affects patients on the ground is that uh, in New South Wales. Um, and the ACT, uh, if you get discharged from a hospital, uh, you're given a week's worth of medication. Um, now, at first that might seem fantastic, um, but if you've been given new medication, which I have on, on many discharges from hospital, um, 
the only place you can then go to get ongoing prescriptions uh, is usually, like I said, they try and push you out to allied health in the community and to general practice. Um, I challenge you, and I'm sure many of you are well aware, um, finding an appointment with a GP in a week, it's not exactly an easy ask of anyone. And what this means practically is that with only a week's worth of medication, the public health system is effectively quite happy to push people out the door with enough essential medication to last them a week, which is a, a really, really big concern when it comes to continuity of medication and stuff like medication safety. And it really doesn't, on the face of it, it doesn't make a lot of sense that we put so much effort into getting someone well enough to send them home and then we effectively only give them a week of solid ground to stand on, knowing full well that in order for them to get access to more medication that they've probably been prescribed, it's gonna take them two or three times longer than the course of medication that they've got to actually get an appointment with someone to get those prescriptions. Now, this is something that states have done. Uh, there is a, a, a national initiative to try and fix this. And one of the reasons why I said that only this happens in New South Wales and the ACT is because independent of all this, the uh, Pharmaceutical Guild has put together something called the National Pharmaceutical Accord, which every state and territory except New South Wales and the ACT have actually signed up for. And one of the things that this accord allows for is for state and territory public hospitals to discharge a patient with a month of medication. So um, if you're in Victoria, I know I noted some people calling in from Melbourne, uh, lucky you or unlucky you, I suppose, if you end up in hospital, but lucky you in the sense that when you get discharged from hospital, um, it's standard practice usually that you'll get a month's worth of medication that you've been prescribed or if any changes have been made. Whereas uh, here for me in Sydney, unfortunately, I get a week and I've got to figure out how to make up the difference uh, from there, which is to me and from our point of view, it, it makes it very, very difficult um, to actually get consistency in the way that we approach care. Um, one of the other really weird peculiarities that it's, um, you know, that it's fallen to people working within the system. And one of the sort of key things I'd, I'd want to highlight is uh, the health system sort of seems to work really well in spite of itself, I think is one of the, the good takes. Um, it's a lot of people working very, very hard, usually against a system that's actively trying to restrict uh, or inhibit their ability to do their jobs well. Um, one of the really strange ways that this is also manifested is that um, at least here in New South Wales, specialists working within public hospital clinics um, will actually often prescribe medication to you under their, under their private health provider number. Because through a weird quirk of legislation um, relating to the pharmaceutical benefits scheme and Medicare, if a doctor in a public hospital prescribes you something in New South Wales under their public provider number, that script is not eligible for the PBS. Uh, so what it means is there's this weird situation where I, as a public patient, I'm going into my, my, um, you know, my, my transplant clinic at the hospital um, and seeing my, my liver specialist, uh, and he's actually prescribing me as a private specialist, not as a public specialist, just because of the way the legislation works, or in this case, the way those two things don't work. Um, now, it's good that we have a workaround and that clinicians have found a way to still prescribe medication that doesn't cost me an arm and a leg. But you know, to, 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 to Jennifer and I's point uh, previously about there not being sort of a grand design to this, it really shouldn't fall, ideally, it shouldn't fall to us and everyone working in the system to find ways of working around some really silly disconnects and sort of legacy legislation that actually stops us from doing what should be a pretty common sense thing. Um, so, so that's sort of what I encourage. Uh, I encourage you to focus on stuff like that. I know it's particularly frustrating, um, but especially at the moment, as Jennifer said, with a lot of focus on Medicare reform, this is a really good opportunity if that's something that you're interested in um, to, to contribute to and, and pick up on what is a really live wire point of discussion. Um, so I would pay very close attention to that if, yeah, if that's something that interests you. Mm, thanks, Harry. I think that's, yeah, they're really good examples of how what can make sense from 
someone's perspective as say a narrow kind of funder or a bureaucrat or someone working within a government department makes no sense for a consumer from a consumer perspective but also an overall systems perspective you know clearly might, yep I was going to say Jeff I might just jump in there as, as well and I think that's why sort of looping back to the systems knowledge one of the reasons why why it is so important is, is is really just also in our ability as advocates to to identify and build relationships with with key players in that system um, more often than not you know pro the scope of, of projects that we might be involved in some are really large scale might be at the complete opposite end and it might be a really specific focus but one of the most powerful ways that we can actually impact this system is through building relationship with the decision makers um, and then getting to the point hopefully where people like us are in a position to actually make those decisions ourselves and contribute to that decision making ourselves i think i just sort of to pick up on um uh it was matilda that made a a, a comment in the chat as well around the sort of this frustration of of our perspective being dismissed um, and i think part of the, the the benefit and the strength of understanding uh, and the point of sort of today's session as well I guess in trying to provide that background um, is so that we can demonstrate that we're not just turning up and identifying problems uh, and sort of stamping our feet um, there's unfortunately a, a perception traditionally sort of on the opposite side of the space that we're kind of just here to make noise and raise issues but understanding the different players and how the system works allows us to take a step beyond and actually start building relationships. And the second we start building relationships and having dialogues with these different stakeholders, they start to understand what's actually valuable to us. And more often than not, it doesn't take long for everyone to realize that we're actually on the same page. And what we're working towards here is actually a, a pretty shared goal. And a lot of those sort of prejudices or preconceived sort of differences um, tend to sort of fall away as people start recognising that they need to work more closely together towards a common end. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think, yeah, recognition of the role of consumers has come a long way, but unfortunately we do still have a long way to go. And I'm still amazed at, you know, spaces like at the press club yesterday, where clearly there isn't just recognition of the need to have a consumer there. So it's still does happen, unfortunately. Um, so does anyone have any sort of questions before we move on to some of the nuts and bolts of the government um, responsibilities and funding? Anything they want to bring up? All righty. Well, so I'll just go through. I'll just, I've just put this in here. This is a picture of healthcare um, workers, doctors and nurses during the um, influenza pandemic 1918 1919 just to remind us all that you know mask wearing which can be quite a hot button issue today <laughs> has actually been around for quite a long time um maybe not with some of the um you know internet trolling <laughs> that goes on today about it though um so i just thought i'd briefly run through what there are some of the main responsibilities are of different levels of government just so um everyone's clear about it because i'll you know why you can have a general understanding sometimes it's um just good to know in a little bit more detail what what their respective roles are um so just to go through these the federal government obviously has responsibility for national policy direction so it sets the sort of big picture policy on health issues it also has responsibility for two of the biggest spending health programs medicare which funds medical services and the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical benefit scheme the pbs which funds prescription medications or subsidizes prescription medications it also has primary responsibility for um, primary health care policy and some funding responsibility, for example, through the primary health care networks, the PHNs. It does provide funding for public hospitals, um, but jointly with the states and territories, but doesn't have service delivery responsibilities there. It directly funds the community controlled Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander primary health care sector. So through the ARCHOs, the Aboriginal community controlled health organisations, it's responsible for private health insurance policy regulation, um, funds that via the private health insurance rebate, directly responsible for veterans health care, has a key role in health and medical research, is the main body that regulates medicines, medical devices, other therapeutic goods, 
and has responsibility for a lot of um, public health policy. So, for example, you know, tobacco campaigns, some things like that. The state governments tend to do more of the on-the-ground on the service delivery, so they run the public hospital system. That would probably be their largest responsibility, and they're also responsible for licensing um, private hospitals and overseeing their, um, you know, their sort of adherence to, to, to hospital standards. They're responsible for some primary healthcare services, so for example, you know, public dental services, alcohol um, and drug services, some public health programs like schools immunizations programs, and they're also responsible for ambulance services. Local government also has a role, um, particularly in relation to public health, so environmental health related services, waste disposal, water supply, etc, monitoring of food standards in restaurants, some community um, home visit services, for example, and some public health activities. And there's also a whole lot of um, areas where there's some shared responsibilities between the Commonwealth and the state governments. So for example, with the regulation of the health workforce, education training, um, regulation of pharmaceuticals, you know, medicines as um, they're dispensed at pharmacies, that both federal and state government have a role there. And state government and the federal government also work together on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health services. Does that make sense to everybody? Is there any specific issues there? Alrighty, so just give you just briefly give you an overview of funding. I mean, funding can be very dry and boring, but it can also be really important to understand where the money is coming from and where it goes, because that is often that often determines a lot about how a service is experienced by a consumer, and it can also help um, identify where the levers are to make changes. So often the way funding systems are set up will um, tell you a lot about how a service is delivered. So tracing that back to look at the funding source. So I thought this was a useful, um, just graphical example of the breakdown of health funding in Australia. And if you look at that um, pie chart, or if you look at the outside, you can see the share of funding, which is government and non-government in Australia. So that shows you that almost three quarters of total health funding comes from government sources. And then, you know, slightly more than a quarter comes from a non-government source. And if you look at the inner circle, you can see that out of those government sources, the Australian government provides the majority of funding. That's the federal government. And then state governments and local governments provide, you know, a substantial but slightly smaller amount. And then if you look at the um, inner circle under the non-government, the light blue section, you can see that that breaks down um, into three main sources, which is individuals, health funds, and then other. Um, one thing that I find really interesting about that is that the in contribution from individuals, and that's mostly in the form of co-payments, so out-of-pocket payments. So for example, a gap payment for a GP, a payment for a non-prescription medication, uh, out-of-pocket costs for an allied health provider, that they actually make up almost twice as much as a health insurance, as a contribution of health insurance funds. So while private health insurance does occupy a lot of space in the media um, and at the political level, it's, it's a, a high priority issue, its contribution, total contribution to health funding is actually pretty small when you look at that pie chart. I think it is around sort of 17, 18%, um, but graphically you can see that it is a small amount and it's substantially less than the direct contribution made by individuals, which receives actually very little um, policy attention or even media attention. You don't often hear discussions around that cost burden to consumers, but I would argue that for consumers, that is actually a very important part of the picture. I think it's just that it occurs across a whole range of different consumers. It's not one funding stream. It occurs at, you know, at the service level through a whole different range of mechanisms. So it's just a harder um, policy nut for the government to crack. And for that reason, unfortunately, I don't, I think it often gets ignored. Um, Harry, do you have anything to add there on the funding side? Oh, look, I, I think it's, not necessarily on on sort of I minutes. Mean, we can't really control, uh, or we have less control than we'd like over sort of what the government does with its money. But in terms of sort of your own approach to 
to um, to projects, one of the things I'd I'd really encourage you um, uh, to sort of keep perspective on that. I think is probably one of the reasons why um, I think it's wrong to say that we don't necessarily spend enough on health. I think one of the really key questions we need to be asking in what is you know hopefully going to be a, a, a period of really significant reform in our system is how well we spend our money to start with. Obviously, if there's areas that need more money after we've figured out how well we spend our money already, then that's we've got to spend put more resources behind it. But one of the things that's really important to understand is is how effectively we actually translate what we're investing into impact that matters to us. One of the reasons that I think our advocacy is so critical is that often the way health services and government evaluate how they uh, create impact is, is usually using performance indicators and metrics that are not particularly mature or meaningful. Um, you know, you can dump $10 million into a campaign, um, you know, to, to deliver a bunch of pamphlets and the government, you know, will usually turn around and say, well, how many pamphlets did we print? We go, okay, well, we printed, you know, half a million pamphlets, fantastic. You know, that was 50,000 more than we were planning, so success. But the fact that those pamphlets were printed doesn't mean that they were understood by people, doesn't mean that they reached the right communities, doesn't mean that they contain the right information. So one of the things that's, I think, really important about, about sort of the money question really is it, it's important to understand what we're investing um, but it's even more important beyond that to understand um, how to best evaluate things. And that's really one of the, 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 the key roles that we can play is by contributing to this discussion and actually making it clear, um, you know, to the different funders what matters to us practically. Um, and, in, you know, in a lot of cases, it's not just whether we improve clinically, it's whether our well-being improves, quality of life access to employment, housing and education. And those, um, as Jennifer said, are unfortunately things that usually fall outside the scope of health so people don't really connect the dots. But one of the strengths um, and perspectives that we can bring is to start tying this stuff together that measuring impact on how we fund things is not just about really, really sort of base metrics. It's about identifying what's valuable and what matters to us in the communities and how that practically practically affects our day-to-day -day lives and whether we're able to engage properly with with the communities and supports around us um, so I'd, I'd also just encourage you to just just keep that in mind with everything that you do um, just because it's a good perspective um, to make sure that, that as advocates we're also recognizing that, that we need to make sure that what we're investing our, our time and effort and resources into realizes an impact that makes a difference because mm. traditionally yeah i think we the crux of it is that we need to be good at doing a lot of things that the government um and a lot of the sector doesn't do a very good job of um yeah which is unfortunate and it's a lot of work for us but yeah we do have a very key role to play in bringing that perspective to actually try and change some of those attitudes Yes, I think that's absolutely true. And I think it's also important to remember that all of that money, so whether it's government or non-government, ultimately does come from consumers. Government money is consumers' money, it's our taxes. So in one sense, everything, you know, all streams of funding are ultimately, you know, money that comes from consumers. And, you know, just before we go to the breakout rooms, I'll just um, put this up. And this is a sort of graphical indication of where that money flows from those different sources. So at the top, you can see the Australian government in that sort of darkish blue um, block that's around, you know, 42, 43% of funding. So the majority of that will go split between hospitals and that will be the grants to the states for public hospitals and primary health care, prim primarily via Medicare. But as you can see, there's also money that goes to referred medical services that specialists um, services and then research, capital expenditure, etc. Um, so if you go on the right hand side and look at those particular areas of, um, of the health system, you can see that often they are receiving funding from multiple different sources and that is part of the complexity of our health system that though, you know each area of, of healthcare 
typically receives funding from a range of different sources and that has different sort of accountabilities, different um, reporting mechanisms and, you know, different levers that can be pulled to make changes. They don't necessarily all work together. Um, and so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an overview of how that sort of funding picture works, um, both, you know, from governments and funding sources to services and then from the service perspective where they get money from. Um, now we're also we're going to move now into breakout rooms. I think Louise has allocated everyone into a small group with a facilitator, which is going to be um, me, James and Daniel. So I think what would be, um, oh, actually, I'll just go through this very quickly, through the three main programs. That's just Medicare, PBS and public hospitals, just to give you a bit of a feel for those um, three of the big, biggest spending programs. I just thought it might be useful just to get a bit of a sense of how those, those play out. Um, so just, yeah, let's just let's look at Medicare, which is around 29% of federal government funding that funds Medicare. So I think the way to look at these health programs is, is that the, the key pieces of information about them are the quantum of money, like how much money they involve, what they fund. And in Medicare's case, there's two main ways that it funds health services. One is medical services in the community, like a GP service, um, some allied health, you know, through the GP. So for example, through the Better Access Program. And then there's also part of Medicare that will fund um, hospital sort of um, medical services provided in hospitals. So there will be a rebate provided for a medical service in hospital um, at a set level of the Medicare, Medicare um, set fee. Um, and that's separate from the hospital costs, um, which are a, a, a cost for the actual hospital part of the services. So, you know, the bed, the food, et cetera. And that's um, typically delivered as a rebate to the patient. Though if a service is bulk billed, um, which means the doctor is accepting the rebate as, a, as their full fee, then that is provided directly to the provider. So there's no actual, you know, patient rebate that takes place directly to consumers. Um, similarly, the PBS um, is a system to, to fund um, prescription pharmaceuticals when dispensed by, uh, um, prescribed by a practitioner, dispensed by a pharmacist. And that again is provided as a patient rebate with safety nets there for people that are higher level users of the system. So a consumer receives that as a subsidy when they um, purchase uh, uh, um, a prescription medicine. So in contrast, like public hospital funding is not delivered through that sort of mechanism as a consumer rebate that is provided directly to the states and territories. And then they will provide that directly to hospitals to run their hospital service. And th those services are provided free at the point of, of service to consumers. So now going on to the, the breakout session, Louise has put us into groups. They're gonna be facilitated by me, Daniel and James. And I just thought it would be useful. Like, please, this is a space for everyone to bring, to talk about issues that you um, are interested in. This is just a, a guideline. Um, if there's anything that's come up, you have any questions about what we've gone through um, so far, then please feel free to, to raise those and we'll do our best to answer them. But these are the issues that I think would be useful um, to talk about, would be to just identify an issue that you have um, some interest in or concern about, a health issue that is important to you in your work or personally, and to discuss what levels of government might be involved, and there may be more than one in that, and identify how governments um, are involved and responsible either as policy setters, as funders, um, or as regulators. And if possible, identify some of the key programs and funding mechanisms that are associated with that issue. So to get a sense of what those um, main drivers are of how that, that service is delivered. So how does how is it funded? Who is responsible for regulating it? What sort of policy framework is there in place? And if we can do our best to talk about, to identify any of those um, that you're not already aware of, I think that will be useful um, to help inform advocacy in that area. So if you could go into those breakout sessions now and then for about um, 20 minutes and then um, go to a break straight after that. So say a 10 minute break. And then if we'll all come back together as a group at um, 2.30. Certainly one of the things that came up in my 
group um, that Isha was part of was just the need for um, more support for people with lived experience um, and a more systematic approach to how advocates with lived experience can play a role throughout the health sector. So a number of members of the group did share their individual experiences, but they were all quite different. Um, and so I think what some of the participants identified was just a need for a, um, yeah, a more systematic approach and maybe some policy and support and funding around um, that as a separate sort of area of, of healthcare rather than leaving it up to individual services or individual programs to incorporate someone with lived experience, which I thought was a great point. Um, um, just before we move on, I just thought it would be worth just looking at Lucinda's question in the chat about the um, pay gap for GP appointments, because um, as she, she has raised, that was an issue discussed at National Cabinet last week, and it is a really important sort of hot button issue that's being debated at the moment um, in the media and in Parliament, and it's one where consumers obviously have a really key interest, and Lucinda's asked how do we support that advocacy and create links, is that federal government funding that needs to be increased, and the GPs setting their own costs due to demand, which is more than the Medicare rebate. So um, yes to both those questions, so it is... Um, Medicare funding. So Medicare does um, provide a rebate for GP, GP services and that rebate has um, not increased in line with inflation. So whether it's, you know, too low is, I guess, a judgment call, but it's certainly true that it hasn't um, increased in line with, say, the cost of providing that, that services for a whole range of reasons. And that is part of the debate at the moment. Um, so in terms of the role of consumers, there's probably a number of different levels where cons consumers can interact. There was a committee set up called the Strengthening Medicare Task Force to look at options to try and address some of the problems in general practice, including affordability. And um, that was the committee I was talking about before, which had, I think, around 18 members and only one consumer um, representative that was CHF. Um, and CHF has done a number of different um, things to provide input into that process, including putting out, say, a which I think a 10-point plan to increase um, um, affordability and accessibility of GP services and part of CHF's position that I'm not, you know, representing CHF because I'm not from CHF, but my understanding of part of the position is that, yes, more money is, is, is required, um, increasing rebates may be part of that process, but there are other things that need to happen as well to make sure that um, Medicare can meet the needs of consumers. Um, so in terms of advocacy, that would involve both, you know, advocacy at the political level, because there is nothing individual GPs can really do about the rebate level. Um, and it's also via organisations such as CHF, um, who are part of that process. Certainly, CHF does have information on the website if you want to, yeah, find that. I was going to say, yeah, so I, I, um, I, um, uh, I chased that question in, into the breakout. I hopped in and um, in our breakout, um, we, we had a bit of a chat um, about that. And sort of one of the things that, that sort of my observations, I guess, was it's also really important to look at sort of the systems and, and parts of the sector that Medicare interacts with. So there's a really big overlap in terms of pressures that one puts on the other between primary care and hospitals and public health. Um, and obviously with, with hospitals and public and public hospitals being state territory and not federal, um, there is a disconnect there, but there's also an opportunity to apply pressure in a different place. One of the really big challenges is the way that the way hospitals manage care, creating additional burden or, or workload for primary care, because there are things that hospitals could be doing a lot better in terms of the way that that we manage and support patients. Um, that, or in arguably in a lot of ways that we don't, we don't help manage and support patients' needs um, that results in them actually needing to access primary care in the community that they might otherwise not have needed to access. Um, so that's another area. So I sort of encourage as well to have a look at, have a look at uh, sort of that sort of, uh, that, that ecosystem. And like I sort of said before, that, that orbit of things is understanding where things are placed and sort of the gravity that, something has and how it impacts 
other areas in the system and how significantly that in that that or how significant that impact is. Um, I'd say as an area, look for anyone that's that's got any free free space on their roster at the moment um, that's looking to direct their attention at something. This is a really important, but I think really um, uh, don't say opportunity ridden is not the right. It's a weird way of putting, there's a lot of opportunity in, in this reform. Um, I was fortunate earlier this week, I um, was involved in a, a clinical governance summit that was hosted by the Australian Digital Health Agency. Um, a number of, of, of contacts that I have um, across the sector and, and people that I knew um, in attendance, uh, a number of them are actually themselves were members uh, or are members of the Medi that Medicare task, the Federal Medicare Task Force. Um, and one of the things that was really reassuring um, to hear, I won't sort of sort of name names or attribute specific comments, but one of the general comments that, that was made um, was that a lot of the discussion that was had in that task force about Medicare and how we reform Medicare was actually not about Medicare. Um, and that should be a really good indication of the mindset of the task force in terms of where they're looking um, to try and start solving these problems. And I think it's also really reassuring um, sort of in, in our little breakout room, I made the comment that, you know, Medicare is, is, is really not, doesn't come into play until after someone's got a problem. Um, it is only a part of the system. It's, it's billing effectively. Um, fixing Medicare singularly is not going to fix our whole health system. But one of the things that's really important to note just in, in, in that comment that the discussion that was had about, about sort of what that Medicare task force was looking at was actually not about Medicare. We should take as a really good level of reassurance that there is actually quite a lot of interest and appetite um, from government and from that task force to look beyond Medicare at the system more broadly. So I'd really encourage everyone, if, you've, if this is something that is interesting to you and, and you've got some time sort of, you know, or some, some items on your, I'm sure very, very long lists of things that you're trying to fix and change and have an impact on. If you've got any free slots, this is certainly something that um, it's a really, really good opportunity and really good timing at the moment because there really is an appetite by the people making those decisions um, to actually be receptive to input from us about how we shape this moving forward. Um, and I think that goes back to as well, just sort of my point earlier about why why these relation building these relationships is so important because um, you know there's the strength of formal conversations, but there's a lot of decisions that get made and really important pieces of information that are usually talked about in an informal capacity. So I'd also I'd also encourage you um, look at the sort of the formal points of contact that you can have across the sector, but also consider the informal points and where you can sort of leverage sort of that soft power um, just through building relationships and being able to have dialogues with people that are really sort of close to the decision-making. That can also be a really effective way um, of actually having an impact. You don't need to be, you know, public superstar household name as an advocate to be having an impact. Um, you can be doing most of your work behind closed doors with not many people outside the sector knowing who you are or what you do and still have an incredible amount of impact if you're able to build relationships with the right people and organisations and get access to the right tables and conversations to input on that decision making. So it's really about finding, I guess, a footing and a place and, and a method to your advocacy that you're most comfortable with and that you feel leverages your insight and lived experience and your talents and interests in the best way possible. Yeah, thanks, Harry. That's, um, I think that's really good insight. Um, and there's just another really good question there from G, which I just might try and um, give some thoughts on before we move on. Um, I think that issue is absolutely so important, the siloing of disability health, um, in a whole heap of areas, you know, research, service provision, education, um, broader policy, such an important issue and, um, yeah, a very systemic problem in our system. 
And we say, is there any action? As far as I know, no. Um, and it is an area which I think really does need to be addressed. I think because of the way um, governments are set up and that the division of government responsibility into portfolios, which are attached to a particular bucket of money. So there's a health portfolio, which has a budget that is discrete to health. There is a minister that is responsible for it. There is a department that, um, that, that you know, carries out the government's priorities. And that is separate from a separate portfolio for disability services for the minister for the structure that sits under that. And it is very rare that those two will intersect. And anyone that's tried to work um, in government across those areas just knows how difficult it is that runs into so many, you know, logistical, organisational, you know, bureaucratic problems. We just do not have a joined up system of government or processes in place to do joint planning, joint service delivery, joint policy development, and it is a, is a major problem. I don't know if anyone else has any insights there, and that's probably not very much help, Jay, except to say that, yes, you know, acknowledging that, it, that it's a problem. Does anyone else have anything that they can suggest to help help G. No, well, yeah, that's yes. I think it just might be one of those one of those issues that just needs more thought, and that I think again highlights the role of consumers just at that grassroots level that sometimes needs to bring those threads together. So if I just go back and I'll attempt to. Um, I might just add quickly, Jennifer, yeah, if, for me too, if we've got time. I'm just conscious of time as well. Yes. Um, Yes, yes. I think that does also raise just an interesting point and something that, that we sort of also, a little bit tangential, but just a good opportunity that we need to be mindful of as advocates is that we don't start replicating and mirroring the same kind of issues that the health system has. Everything in the system is incredibly siloed. Um, and unfortunately, the nature of, of, all, of, you know, there being a lot of us focusing on really specific things means that to a certain extent over the years, the advocacy sector is, itself has become progressively more siloed as well. Um, so one of the things we've got to be mindful of is that our advocacy also individually doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, we need to be mindful of what one another is doing and, and make an effort to build, you know, solid connections and, and communities and dialogues amongst ourselves to ensure that, that we're all actually um, working on the same page um, and not sort of duplicating uh, or, or creating sort of uh, sort of weird overlaps that actually make things more challenging. Um, I, I think in a number of ways that it's using an example, uh, the, the mental health sector is, is sort of a, a maybe a controversial example of sort of where that siloing I think is most prevalent. Mental health originally has become such an issue and government marked it out singularly as needing so much attention. Um, that it's in itself become quite a bit of a silo. And one of the big challenges with the mental health space at the moment is its lack of connectivity to other areas of health. Um, you know, you look at uh, mental health in the, public in, in, in the public health system, you'll have mental health supports in public hospitals that don't connect properly with any other part of the hospital, despite the fact that the, the, the reason that people are probably going to that hospital um, overwhelmingly is actually usually for uh, some kind of physical illness um, from which mental health becomes a component of their care. Um, but it's not managed and coordinated or connected well enough so that, that those mental health concerns actually become so significant that they become quite dominating. And then that takes them out of, out of their, their original um, setting and puts them in a mental health setting, which is unfortunately then completely disconnected from the supports that are taking care of their, their physical chronic uh, illness and disability. Um, so that's sort of a, that's where we've unfortunately maybe turned the dial a bit too far on getting specific. Um, and, and it'd be good if, if in that space, we could move back towards some more connectivity in terms of actually linking mental health up more properly and recognizing that as much as it is, you know, singularly a very significant challenge, it, it also is intrinsically connected to every other area of our health system um, and, 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 and service provision. Um, so I think all, we've just also got to be mindful um, that we don't start to exhibit and mirror the same issues and siloing that the health system has that we're trying to fix. Um, it's not an easy thing, um, but I, I do think we do a better job of 
uh, of maintaining our community and our dialogue than the health system probably does. But it's just something to be mindful of. And I think this is a, this is a good example where where our advocacy on on that disability space, we just we need to as much as we're trying to tackle a single issue, we need to be mindful that we're not being so specific that we actually start othering the things that we're advocating for and and effectively carving them off of um, you know sort of of the agenda to the point where they actually become very, very separated and, and hard to manage in, in a continuity of care or, or connect to other things. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I do think consumers often just have to sort of almost be kind of bilingual in the sense that they need to be able to speak the, you know, the language and understanding of sort of government's bureaucracy service providers while also maintaining that consumer perspective. And it's not an easy, an easy role to play sometimes. Um, so I'm just going to, you know, quickly go through some of the other organisations that form part of the health system, which can also be relevant to advocacy, um, just in case they are ones that you might come across um, and need some clarity around what their roles are. So um, one group is medical colleges, and they are in a range of different health um, and medical disciplines. So, you know, general practice and various specialties, and they're the ones responsible for training programs and accrediting um, specialists or, you know, medical areas of expertise. They're responsible for setting the standards and for usually providing that, that, that training. And then there is a peak national body called the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency, which sets up, sits above sort of medical colleges or individual um, providers of education in say other health disciplines like physiotherapy, and they accredit those bodies so those those education and training bodies and keep a registration of practitioners so they're the people that will for example you know maintain records of which you know doctors have supervision orders for example so a doctor that might be under um some order not be able to prescribe opiates or something like that so that's a place you can go to find out um, if there are any issues with individual providers or to make sure that they are actually you know accredited as part of you know their area of um of you know expertise another important group is the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare so they're um, like a peak body funded by the government and their job is to set up to to do research and um, set standards for, for broad safety and quality in healthcare they work across a number of different areas um, and they're funded jointly by federal and state state governments and they focus on issues like um, you know what does safe care look like how does that operate in different areas of the health system is there a need for particular standards in the area they have a stream of work that involves working with consumers they are quite a consumer focused organization and they do fund um, various processes and you know studies committees um, work groups that's that are involved in setting standards that involve consumers working with providers and working with um, medical and, and healthcare professionals in those areas. Another group is APRA, the Australian Prudential um, Regulation Authority. So that's the statutory authority that's, that looks at financial standards in organisations that are responsible for finance in various areas of finance and in health, that means private health insurance. So that's the group that looks at whether private health insurance is maintaining appropriate standards to be able to, um, you know, do their job to meet their, their fiduciary requirements to, you know, pay out money for people that need um, need healthcare and have private health insurance. Another group which has a very broad remit but often relevant to health is the Commonwealth Ombudsman and that provides a sort of review process and complaints process for um, decision making by groups that are part of um, either you know publicly funded groups in health that would include you know groups like say a, a public hospital um, but also does do some private services as well so they're, they're a fairly high level group and they operate when um they sort of come in when individual complaints and, and can't be resolved at the service delivery level or within you know a, a more microstructure of the health system and each state and territory also has a complaints commission um for you know consumer concerns and complaints to do with health services in that state. So they don't necessarily have to be funded by the state government, but just occur within that state government. So there's some, 
in yeah in geographically within that state or territory so there's some of the other organizations that can also be involved in the health system which may also have a role in um advocacy and um i thought it also might be useful just to look at you know given that understanding of levels of government funding mechanisms programs and some of the other organizations involved to look at some of the questions that you as advocates might want to ask yourself when you're trying to decide whether to focus your attention and energy and to look at what the most effective um, process might be and i think one of the useful questions to ask is whether the issue you're concerned about is that something related primarily to an individual service provider is it a problem with that individual provision of service or is it a more systemic issue does it have to do with some broader issues of policy or funding and I think as Harry suggested you know if you go back far enough everything probably has some sort of policy or or funding um, issue behind it but is it primarily something which should be addressed at the individual service provider level or organizational level um, and I think another question is to look at what changes would need to be made to improve to make the changes that you think need to happen within the health system. Is it a matter of a service being provided differently? Um, would a change in policy, a change in education and training, a change in the way something's funded, would that make a difference? To, so think about um, what you think would be the most effective way of making that change. Uh, I think once you've done that, it can help then to identify what level of government might be responsible. So if you think what might be most useful is for funding to change. So in um, say Lucinda's point, if it's a matter of um, you know high costs to go and see a GP, if you identify that increasing the rebate may help that, then that's obviously the responsibility of the federal government. So that's the level at which you should be advocating. Um, and then also identifying if there's any other bodies involved in that. So in relation to general practice, that could be the College of General Practitioners, which is the medical college that covers, you know, train education and training for GPs. And then finally, just to look at if there's any other sort of regulatory processes or funding mechanisms that might influence the delivery of services in that area. So again, looking at um, Lucinda's question, the rebate may be one, um, one mechanism to, for funding general practice and one lever that could be, you know, adjusted to, you know, potentially make general practice more accessible to consumers, but there's other ways that governments will fund primary health care. So one area might be through um, the primary health care networks that, that is funded, you know, by primarily by the Commonwealth, also, you know, partly state government. So one additional funding mechanism may be that more funding is given to um, the PHNs to support the delivery of general practice services to meet a need in their community. So if there are groups, for example, you know, young people, people with disabilities, you know, people with um, mental health needs who can't access traditional general practice, maybe another funding mechanism might be to provide funding to PHNs to commission services that are more accessible for people in those areas. And I've just, you know, given a few examples there of different services that you might um, have an interest in just to look at how that might play out. So, you know, for example, of looking at, say, you know, um, psychologist in private practice, the level, you know, high level responsibility for policies around psychology um, and mental health is for the Commonwealth. But given that it's a private provider, the Commonwealth doesn't directly provide those services. They do have some role sometimes in um, funding those services, either via the MBS, if it is delivered as part of, um, you know, the Better Access Program, for example, or sometimes partly through private health insurance, if the consumer has private health insurance. And then again, some of the um, professional bodies that might be involved, say the psychology board. So they might be the points of contact um, and areas that you might want to look at if you have a particular issue that you want to raise around, you know, private psychology. If it's something like, say, um, you know, a private hospital service, both Commonwealth and state government have a role in that. So depending on what the issue is, might depend upon what um, level of government you think you need to be focusing your adv advocacy activities. Um, and if you're looking at the payment systems and the, the flow of funding that can come either via direct consumer payment, and that would be something that would um, occur at the service level. If you're looking at broader policy set settings, it could be via private health insurance, which may partly fund that, and that is the responsibility of um, the Commonwealth government. And that would include also, you know, 
MBS funding, so Medicare funding, if it's to do with medical fees. So if you have an issue with, say, you know, the funding of a specialist service, that would be funding by Medicare. Um, but again, if it's a service that occurs, you know, within a particular state and territory, there may also be a role for state and territory based um, healthcare complaints commissions, if what you're concerned about involves making a complaint about a particular hospital. Um, Harry, did you have anything you wanted to add there? about how to link sort of particular issues with looking at, you know, policies, government, levels of government funding mechanisms, other groups? I think it sort of just comes back to the sort of point that I've, I guess I've made a number of times now, but it's just sort of that really useful to, to figure out sort of where the responsibility for these things sits. And that's where you sort of direct your attention. Um, you know, a good example for, Sort of that comes to mind for me is you know all the time that I've spent in hospital when something I think could have been done better or something didn't happen the way that that I wanted it to at my bedside um, as frustrated as I was I wasn't about to get angry at a nurse over it um, you know and the fact that I was sitting there waiting for a long time um, you know when I had an issue and I you know couldn't mobilize out of my bed because I was immediately post major surgery and it took a while for someone to actually turn up and go what's going on are you okay um understandably i'm frustrated at that point um but there's not a lot that one of three nurses looking after 27 patients is going to be able to do on the spot to actually change the way that care is delivered um so in that sense i want to say maybe a bit controversially but figuring out who to be angry with is probably a good way of putting that um and understanding that okay well if you sort of start stepping back and you look at who how, how are people actually supported and resourced to do what they do well that sort of issue with the nursing is is about sort of who's on staff and, and ratios and that goes back to the hospital and then the hospital goes okay well unless we're given direction by the state government we're really not going to take our own initiative and do that ourselves so then you go okay so we've got to go a step beyond that and go to the state government and then that's a dialogue around um you know how the state government resources and implements you know potential statewide policy that, that requires ratios like exist in victoria and other places but unfortunately don't in new south wales yet um and then if people want to be particularly tricky the state government could turn around and say well that's a funding issue that has to do with our agreement with federal government and that's when you start getting in a bit of a frustrating roundabout so understanding sort of where the money comes from and where that that resourcing actually is materialized and its point of origin is yeah it's a really useful way of figuring out where and who to be angry at uh, if we want to be a bit more cynical um, but also practically you know where we apply pressure to get something done and i think most importantly stopping ourselves from from venting and expressing our frustrations to people that ultimately don't actually have control over this the number of times that that i've you know had uh, an opportunity to have a more in-depth dialogue with a clinician or even with representatives of of, of, of peak medical um you know peak medical colleges uh, and bodies where they turn around and we talk about an issue that, you know, I was under the impression, you know, it's within your power to fix this. And they turn around and go, well, actually, you know, there's these three different pieces of legislation that tell us what we can and can't do here. So if we want to change it, we actually need to go to government over this. And all of a sudden, the really useful thing is that I'm now sitting there with someone that I thought I had a problem with and going, oh, okay, right, I see we need to work together on this. And suddenly two different ends of the spectrum um, you've got, you know, a clinician now and, and, a, and a patient and a consumer advocate is now sitting down on the same page and going, okay, so we need actually to join up and focus our attention on this point to make this thing happen. Unfortunately, a lot of this stuff does come down to, to money at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, learning how that flows. And I think most importantly, how we, how we maximize the impact of what we spend. Um, is, is a really important thing to be considered because um, it's it's not enough to just spend lots. That doesn't guarantee we actually realise anything. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Harry. I think that, yeah, they're all really, really excellent points. Um, I think it'd be great if we could go back into the breakout rooms now and maybe talk about those issues um, 
as they relate to, you know, participants' areas of interest. So, you know, I think as, as Harry very, you know, eloquently put it, who to be angry at. So we talk about in your particular area of interest, um, who would be the most effective person to get angry at. And um, I think in my group, at least people had excellent advice for each other from their own experience around what, you know, had worked, what hadn't worked and suggestions for um, each other. So I think it would be great to workshop those. And if we could all come back at around um, 3.20, just for um, a recap, final questions, and just to go through some, you know, resources about, you know, how to take further action, that would be great. Thanks everyone. I can't believe that it's almost the end. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to do some quick closing remarks and thank everyone for participating and thank you particularly for, for my group. I certainly learned a lot from all of you and um, yeah, really impressed and blown away by your experience and knowledge and um, yeah, feel a lot more confident about the future of the health system because, you know, if you you guys are going to have a role in in um, shaping it, I think we're in much better hands than we maybe have been previously. Um, and, yeah, just so, yeah, just to close out, if there's any other questions or anything that anyone else wants to, to raise um, that we didn't cover, obviously it's a, you know, very sort of broad overview, um, can't, yeah, can't discuss everything, um, but hopefully that's given you some picture of some of at least the, you know, broad you know, map of the health system, some of the main sort of processes, funding, policy development, service delivery processes that are involved. Um, I don't know if, Louise, did you send out that list of um, resources to participants? Just, yeah, for further resources. So just if you want to have a look at at those I mean they're fairly self-explanatory I guess the only ones that I think might be that we haven't really covered today is I've put in links and contacts to um, federal parliamentarians and also where you can find state and territory parliamentarians so if you want to advocate at that level then that will give you the contact details of how to contact them it sometimes can be a little bit difficult to find and also at the end I've just put some information there about um, alternative sort of media, non-mainstream media sources, because often the way the debates are played out in the mainstream media often doesn't give a whole lot of space for consumers. And there are places there um, that I've, I've given you um, some contacts for and some links to are areas where you might get a more detailed sort of or different perspective on some of those health issues that you might find useful and if I just put in a plug for Kroki um, which is I'm one of the editors of we are always keen to hear from young people we're very keen to publish um, stories by young people and we're very open to working with young people um, if you haven't had a lot of experience in writing um, pieces for publication we're very open to working with you to develop something and to support you to get something out there so just to let you know and I've just put my contacts up there um, so please yeah feel free to to reach out um, if you have any further questions or discussion and I know Louise would be happy to hear from you issue you wanted yeah you put your hand up would you like to contribute something um yeah hi Jennifer I just wanted to add on to uh, our discussion um, and just wanted to say that it's definitely like I can talk for mental health because I've been involved in a lot of like different core design sessions in different organizations. So I've definitely seen that there's a lot of funding coming through and there's a lot more acceptance to get that perspective from lived experience into what needs to be done. But one of the challenges that I feel is that at least in the mental health system, not sure about the other aspects of healthcare, that the power to actually invest that money in different places still sits in the hand of clinicians or people from non-lived experience backgrounds, where we, like I have personally noticed that gap that a lot of preference is given to, you know, hiring more clinicians or psychologists and towards those things rather than lived experience workforce so there's money that goes to a mental health service but it might not necessarily mean that it's been utilized towards if what has been suggested by the lived experience phase and that's where I felt like it was a bit of a challenge yeah I think that's a great point and I think it does you know raise the need for more advocacy in general for the role of people with lived experience so not just in any particular service 
delivery area or a policy area, but just overall, it just should be part of um, the way that the health disability sector does business, shouldn't it? It shouldn't just be something that's left up to individual programs or service delivery areas. Um, Harry, is there anything you'd like to say by way of closing remarks or, you know, respond to, to Isha or any of the other participants? Um, I guess I just want to say, you know, firstly, it's fantastic to be able to contribute to something like this. Um, I really do hope everyone's found today um, to be valuable. Um, you know, we were sort of really conscious of trying to, to make sure that there was there's some good practical takeaways, sort of no matter where where you're coming from or, or, or what challenges you're, you're trying to address in the space that you're working and, and, and you know, sort of really inputting your, your time, energy and passion. Um, I, I suppose sort of one sort of reflection I have on today and, and one thing that, um, you know, as someone that's been around in this space for, for a while, um, I'm by no means the definitive expert on advocacy. Um, I've got a way that works well for me um, that I've put a lot of effort into developing that within that I think is a really important lesson is that there's no there's no ultimately right way for us to do what we do there are I think we've got to be honest with ourselves there are more and less effective ways that we can advocate um, but I don't think it would be correct for us to say that there is an objective right and wrong way to do something this is a, a really complicated space with you know, some really significant um, and complex challenges. Um, and, and I think it's important that, that we sometimes take a step back for ourselves and recognize that it's not necessarily our job to try and fix everything all at once. Um, I'd say if you're similar to me in any way, shape or form, you probably tend to put a lot of pressure on yourself to try and get things done and fix problems. Um, but I think it's also important for us to recognise that we're not going to fix everything overnight um, and that we ultimately, in leveraging our lived experience, have to be doing so in a way that's comfortable and safe for us and sustainable for us, I think, as well. Um, so I think, yeah, one, one also really good takeaway from, from today that, that I hope people have is, is not just the importance of, of, of that systems understanding to informing sort of that where, what, um, how and who lens that you sort of direct your advocacy through to identify the right places to direct your energy, but also recognising that, yeah, you, there's not a specific way that you have to be doing something to be right in what you do. Um, you've got to find a way that works for you, that's effective and sustainable for you, um, and that most importantly is safe and comfortable for, for the lived experience perspective um, that you're bringing to the table and hoping to contribute. Um, so I might just, I might also just, uh, Louise, if you're happy for me too, I might just drop, I might just drop a link to my website and it's, and it's got some contacts in it, in the chat as well, just for anyone that just wants to follow up on anything specifically, if there's something that, that comes to mind for you. Otherwise, um, yeah, as Jennifer said, I'm, I'm sure there's any other stuff people can hopefully direct some questions and, and good feedback, um, through to Louise. Um, after the session. But yeah, very much hope everyone found something valuable in today. So, and I appreciate you all being here and, and sharing so openly. Mm. Thanks, Harry. Very wise words there, as usual. Um, Louise, is there anything you'd like to, like to say no. to everyone? Oh, hey. Um, so there's going to be a feedback survey. Uh, email that to you um, just as soon as we finish up here. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I really appreciate you giving your time and participating and being here with us and sharing contributing or you know just listening and being part of this I think it's, it's really important um you know to be part of something like this in whatever way feels good for you um a really 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 big thank you to Jennifer and Harry um Jennifer from the beginning when you started talking to me about you know these different areas I was just in awe and enthralled and I'm so grateful that you've been able to give us your time and your expertise for this and Harry your contribution, the way that you share your stories and the way that you, um, you know, share your lived experience and how, you know, this, this works for you and, and, you know, this sort of journey that you're also on, you know, I always really appreciate the way that you share that. So thank you as well. And thank you for being part of it. Uh, thanks to James and Daniel from um, CHF for uh, facilitating the breakout rooms. Um, really grateful to have you here as well. 
And yeah, look, thank you so much. Um, you know, we'll have more events in the future through CHF. Um, you know, we usually have a whole lot of different areas of interest um, to share in different workshops and events, whether they're webinars, um, big events, small events, uh, we'll just keep on having them. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh yeah, and I'll be here if you need anything too. Thanks, Louise. Thanks everyone. See you.